listen, Barbara, you are incredibly well known in the US, of course. Um, but over this side of the pond in the UK or maybe other parts of the world, you know, because podcasts are listened to all over the world. Maybe people don't know so much about your backstory and, and kind of where you've come from and what you've done. So it would be amazing if you would give us a quick canter through and then we are going to get into all the detail from there. If that's OK, okay. I love it. So um, in here in the US, I'm really uh, known as an on air television personality. I do lifestyle and entertainment programs on like the Today Show, Good Day New York, Insight Edition, which are all like the top best fun morning programs and, uh, you know, just programs here in the U.S. Um, and it is actually a career that I launched in my 40s after battling stage three cancer and feeling that I, you know, and just kind of being confronted with my own mortality. Um, so it's, uh, you know, a career that I launched later in life. I absolutely love it. Um, I was a stay at home mom. I kind of fell out of the sky and into this amazing career. Um, but there was a mindset shift that I'll talk about, you know, as we go, go on that kind of, you know, cancer, you know, didn't just break me, it actually built me um, with some new wheels to kind of go for what I wanted. Um, you know, my, I was a stay-at-home mom prior to that. I was in direct sales. So um, it's just an interesting evolution that I love to share with people. Um, you know, your next chapter is always going to be better than the last one if you got the right mental game. So that's my story. I'm still, um, you know, I'm still plugging away and reinventing myself and just trying to live my best life. <laughs> Oh, I love it. And you're right, you know, that actually it isn't just one life we have, they're multiple lives, aren't there, actually? And every stage is amazing and, and can be wonderful. And I love the fact that you are so energetic, you've got this grand vision, um, and you're absolutely killing it in so many areas. It's it's wonderful, it's so inspiring. So so let's talk about the early years, if we can, Barbara, a little bit. Take us back to kind of where you grew up, family background and things like that. Cause I know that, you know, that's also inspiring for people to hear as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. So I, uh, people, this is my fun family fact. I am a twin. I have a twin brother. I am four minutes older and in twin land, that's a really big deal. Um, and I also have younger twin brothers um, in our family. Uh, it runs in our family. My mother is a triplet. So it's not that big of a deal. The biggest deal was that I didn't have twins. I have three kids. Um, but also runs in our family as a condition known as fragile X, which is a genetically inherited form of neurological impairment. And it's a lot like Down syndrome. Um, you can now genetically test for it. But back then, we, you know, the 1970s, we didn't know. Um, and my, so my younger brother, so there's a set of, I have a twin brother, Ben, and then the younger set is Michael and Steven. My brother, Steven, has fragile X. And um, from a very young age, I've just always known, I always knew that I would, you know, speak from, we were very, very connected and I always took care of him. Well, somewhere in middle school, the wheels for the family kind of fell off and I always call it growing up Schwartz. So it's like, it's my maiden name and we were very well loved, but they took some risks. The Schwartzes took some risks and didn't work out. So at one point, all of us had to get separated. My dad had to move to California and live with his brother. And my mother had to move to East Windsor, New Jersey and live with her cousin. So the four of us had to get separated. And whatever form or fashion we, you know, we like three would be here, one would be there, two would be there, four would be there. We would all kind of get jockeyed around because we didn't want to like impose too much on our, you know, relatives. And in, you know, I spent a year, a, a year and change in California living with my dad. And at one point it was just Stephen and I, um, and we were always together, but I had decided I wanted to start high school in New Jersey and I got my aunt to buy us tickets. It had been a very, very rough year. Um, it just wasn't, you know, it was just, we, the money was tight. Um, you know, we had no, it was just a difficult time, but Stephen always went with me. So we're at LAX airport and Stephen is having a meltdown at epic proportion. I'm 13, 14 years old and he's three years younger. And when I say he's having a meltdown, he doesn't care about other people looking at him or creating a scene. It's not in his wheelhouse. And we get to the gate and he is on the floor and he won't get on the plane. Then they're boarding and they're boarding. And my dad looks at me and says, Barbara, I'll, I'll keep Steven. Steven will stay in California with me. You have to get on the plane. High school had already started. Like I was just floating around the, you know, ether, you know, like not in high school, not in registered in school. 
And I was like in a panic. I was like, I don't, Stephen goes with me. And my father was like, uh, I'm the father and Stephen goes with me. And I was like, no, Stephen goes with me. And the stewardess and the, they're boarding. They're like, we're, we're leaving. You guys need to, you, you need to board this plane. And I was in such, like, I was really panicked and I get on the floor and I just, you know, quietly whispered. I'm like, Stephen, you have got to come with your sister. You have to come with me. I can't leave you. And by the grace of God, he got up and actually took my hand, walked me on the plane. And I waved with like this backhanded wave, wave to my father, like, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. And I got him on the plane. He completely passes out because he's exhausted. It's a red eye flight. It's a red eye flight. I'm young. I should have passed out and gone to sleep. But instead, I plotted my entire life. I plotted my life with such rage and love and intensity. And I was crying, but I was crying with such clarity and understanding of like, I will never not take care of you. I will not only take care of you, I will make sure you live a great life. I will figure out how to make money. I will never put you in this situation. Seeing him under such distress and then under like with the threat of us being separated really broke me through to this clarity and I plotted my life at 13 I think I might have been 14 at 14 years old I plotted my life I knew I was going to put my I was like I don't know how I'm going to do this but I knew what I was going to do and it's true that that vow that I made it at 14 led me past um, any sort of give up, quit, what have you at, throughout my life. I wanted to quit putting myself through college. And I thought I can't take care of Steven. I started a sales company when I was in my twenties and it all hinged on, I had to be financially, I had to make money because I, the thought of him being institutionalized or being in that state of distress ever again, I felt like I had that vow, that it wasn't always in the forefront of my mind, that it definitely sat in my soul. And it was like a, like a, a soul promise of like, I'm gonna do it. And when I wanted to quit anything, I never quit because of him. And that's, um, I think that's, yeah, that's, that brings you up to my story. And I, you know, I can go deeper into all that, but that's really what drives me. I'm very aligned with purpose and it got me through uh, cancer at one point too. So yeah, that's my story. <laughs>